Hello everyone, it's Albert. In my previous video, I discussed Earl Doherty's use of certain passages in the epistles of Paul in the New Testament, where he claimed that Paul's idea of Jesus was a, an ethereal mythical Jesus, and I went through his top three choices to show that that really wasn't the case. Now, at the beginning of the video, I said I would do a couple of those and then one additional one that I wanted to discuss, but I never got to the last one, mainly because the video had already gone to a half hour and I didn't want to belabor the point any further in the video because someone sees a video that lasts, you know, an hour, they may not probably wouldn't want to sit through it, particularly on that topic. So I cut it short at that point and set up in so now I'd like to come back to that and discuss the particular passage in question that I wanted to discuss and how he had interpreted that and how, in fact, his interpretation was, well, frankly, quite bogus. And the passage in question is in, the, in Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Um, and it's on the beginning of chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and I will be discussing in particular how he deals with the, the phrase, born of a woman, which uh, under any common sense interpretation means, well, born of a woman, which would kind of make you a human being, which he, of course, denies. And, and I mentioned when he gets, I mentioned in passing that when he deal, gets to passages like that, that obviously point to an historical Jesus. He does through all sorts of gymnastics to try to deny the fact. And here I want to go through his explanation of that. And I'm taking ma mainly from an, art an online article that he gives, um, but there's also corroborating testimony and, and some additional things I've taken from his most recent book, Jesus, Neither God Nor Man. Um, and I just want to show just how utterly ridiculous his, arg his line of argumentation is that it really makes no sense and he completely distorts not only the passage but in addition that particular scholar that he cites in defense of his position where he completely misrepresents what that person said and um, and I'll get and we'll be getting to that but now let's first look at the passage itself so here is the passage in question. It's, as I said, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, this paragraph here. And it states, Paul writing, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir, through God. So how does Earl Doherty handle that passage? Well, he begins by taking the phrase, God sent his own son, and then attempting to equate that with the later God sending the spirit of his son into our hearts, and he states, well, they both have the exact same verb. Well, of course they do. They're both sent. Um, they're both the equivalent of, of the English word sent. So, of course, they're going to the same verb. But that doesn't mean they're both the same sending, which is what he's trying to make it out. He equates the two and then says, this is hardly the coming of the historical Jesus of Nazareth into the world, but the arrival of the spiritual Christ and the current phenomenon of the divine revelation. And thus, he's assuming these two cases of the verb sent describe the same event, but as we shall see, the context shows quite otherwise. Now let us take a look, in, as I said, in 
at the passage and in particular we're going to take a look at the two sendings but when the fullness of time came God sent forth his son born of a woman here and the later because you are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts and he attempts Dory attempts to equate these two now what he as I pointed out he states they are both aorist case which is absolutely true they're both the same verb both the same tense past tense each a past event How, however just as I said just because you're the same tense the same verb the two different sendings doesn't mean they're the same sending just because they're both sendings and in fact that's the case because besides having the, the sendings themselves there's a qualifying phrase at the beginning telling you when this occurs and here it's for example it says but when the fullness of time came and on the other one because you are sons that's the qualifying phrase which sets the precondition for when each of the sendings occurs now in God sending the son born of a woman the phrase but when the fullness of time came the the verb there is also aorist and so the condition is something that occurred in the past the condition for the first sending is something that occurred in the past and has been completed in the case of God sending the spirit of his son because you are sons the tense is not past it's present indicative it indicates an action occurring in the present thus one sending the precondition is already completed and in the other one the precondition is ongoing so what what's occurring here is that based upon the tenses we can expect God to continue to send the spirit of his son to Christians it's an ongoing the condition is ongoing but the sending of the son born of a woman was a singular event fixed in the past thus by the grammar alone they have to be separate events moreover they are also logically separate events and I want you to pay attention to how Paul makes a sequence in this phrase the first thing he states is that the 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 fullness of time came then God sent forth his son born of a woman which is so the fullness of time came as the precondition then God sent his son born of a woman born under the law so that which means he sent him so that he might redeem those who were under the law so that comes after the precondition for that is the, is the coming of the son born of a woman so you've got a third thing the first is the appointed time coming the second is God setting us on board of a woman and the third is the redemption and then he goes on to say that we might receive so that comes after the redemption we might receive the adoption as sons so that's a fourth thing then because you are sons so this is coming after being adopted as son because you are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts and then finally we become heir, heirs of all that is God so you have a sequence of six things each a precondition for the one that follows a point in time coming God sending a son born of a woman the redemption receiving adoption as sons of God's God sending the spirit of his son to us and then finally we become heir of all, heirs of all that is God's each statement was a condition for the one before it in Paul's chain of conditions but the sending of the son is the second in that sequence and the sending of the spirit of his son is the fifth in that sequence and each being a precondition for the one following they cannot possibly be the same event they have to be separate events on logical grounds this alone destroys his argument completely it's 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 utterly destroyed it makes no sense trying to equate these two the first one is in fact the incarnation when Christ became incarnate into Virgin Mary and the fifth is when God sending the spirit of the son to us that's an event well, the first one was, as I said, a, a, an event completed in the past, the sending of a son born of a woman that's incarnate in the Virgin Mary. The other one, which is an ongoing event, began at Pentecost. So it started in the past and continues to the present, God sending the Holy Spirit to Christians.
That's what this whole sequence is about. They're, the two sendings are not the same thing. One is the sending of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The other is the sending of the Holy Spirit to Christians beginning at Pentecost. And therefore, they are not the same event. As I just pointed out, both the grammatical structure of the sentence and the logical structure of the sentence completely demolish Doherty's argument. They're obviously not the same sendings. Um, they're not a, they're not, you cannot equate them. And I, I find this a lot with Doherty. He makes bad grammatical arguments, and, and it, which makes me wonder exactly how much Greek does he really know, he, he, since he was supposed to be a classics major. I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. Um, but it all, I also have to wonder how much, you know, the, the, frankly, the man can't deduce his way out of a paper bag. He makes logical errors, and I pointed some of them out in the previous um, video, but he, the, the, he just makes all sorts of logical errors. He can't seem to understand anything in context. And again, I'm assuming he really is just ignorant of the subject. Um, I, I'm trying not to assume the worst, that he's being intentionally deceptive. So it's either he's completely ignorant of what's there in front of him, or or he's so blinded by his ideology that he, he it, it, it simply prevents him from under, from reading what's there, right there in, in, in words. And just a simple logical deduction or a simple examination of the grammar would demonstrate that that can't what he's saying cannot be the case but he fails to see it now even though i pretty much thrown that his argument aside i'm going to continue with other things he pushes into reinforce his argument uh, which are equally baseless but i i'm just for the sake of completeness i'm going to continue with his his presentation and continue to show how bad, just exactly how bad it is. The next point Doherty makes refers to verse 7, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. And Doherty at this point makes one of his, what I referred to in the previous video as the God versus Jesus false dichotomies, and he states that Verse 7 piles the evidence of Paul's meaning even higher. You are there he, where he says he's no longer a slave but a son and a son, then also an heir through God. And he says if Paul had the acts of an historical Jesus in mind when he spoke of freedom and attaining the status of sons in verse 5, why does he now revert to calling such things the result of an act of God? If, however, he had in mind the revelation of the Son and his acts in the spiritual realm, the idea of the agency of God becomes fully intelligible. Well, again, as I pointed out, this Paul commonly uses God and Jesus interchangeably. I've proven that in the previous video. But there's even a bigger point here, which is simply, again, Earl Doherty is not reading the passage in context, but merely taking it in isolation and pointing to this one thing and ignoring all that preceded it. What I would do to anyone who buys into the nonsense Doherty has spewed on this particular passage is merely start at the beginning of Galatians and read through. Don't do what Doherty does, which is just grab something and rip it totally out of context and pour in a presupposed meaning. Just start at the letter at the beginning and read it. And it'll soon become obvious just how bogus Doherty's claim is. Um, because if you merely read it from start to finish, you will soon realize the entire point Paul was making, beginning chapters earlier and continuing through this one, was about God's promise to Abraham, which occurred many centuries before the time of Jesus. It's only fulfilled through Jesus, but the whole basis of the conversation was began many centuries earlier so it's all an act of God not an act of Jesus because this is what it's talking about the emphasis here is on God's promise to Abraham that's the whole point of this entire passage is the is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham if you if you read it you'll find that it's all built the whole conversation is this whole for a couple of chapters here is built upon God making that promise God giving the law, God allotting the time when his promise would be fulfilled, God sending his son to redeem us, God adopting us as children, and God sending the Holy Spirit. In other places of 
in his letters, Paul does place the emphasis on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and it, he's always talking about being redeemed through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But this passage was about God working his salvific purpose through the whole of human history, and, this, and his stressing God's work has nothing to do with the historicity of Jesus. It's just utterly bogus what Doherty's claiming here. And it's it's simply reading the reading the letter is enough to see. It's 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 so utterly bogus. It's hard to believe that anyone could read Galatians and take what they were saying here seriously. It makes no again, as I pointed out, if you take his interpretations, what he does is he rips things out, puts an interpretation upon it, forces his, an alien interpretation upon the passage. But when you take all those interpretations and plug them back in the letter, they make absolutely no sense. None. The whole thing is, is just make Swiss cheese out of it. No one would have understood that in the first century, the way he's interpreting it. Because it's simply, the, 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 the claims he makes don't hang together. They, they, once you put them back in the letter, they make no sense. And because they've basically just been ripped out of context, and he's putting this artificial meaning into them. But it, it, it's, not, it's not, utter nonsense, the whole thing. But let us now continue even further. The next passage, part of the passage Doherty focuses upon is, is on verse 5, so that he might redeem those who are under the law. Now, what Doherty is try, tries to claim is that the he here refers to God because God is the subject of the sentence. He says, God, in this sentence, God is still the subject, therefore the he refers to God. Uh, to put it the way he put it is, and I'm going to quote him directly here, further, in the Greek of verse 5, the subject of the verb literally redeem, remains God. In other words, Paul has introduced Jesus into the present period, but he has failed to follow through by expressly having him do the redeeming while he is here. He's claiming that he here refers to God and not to Jesus. When I read this statement by Doherty on this particular verse, I was just in shock. I mean, this is so amateurish. This is... This is, frankly, this is Greek 101 stuff, and he gets it dead wrong. Um, let me explain. The, the structure of the sentence, it has the, the Greek conjunction participle hina, uh, followed by the third person singular, masculine singular form of the verb, which basically, if you, when you translate it into English, will have a pronoun usually with it because of the way English is structured. It'll say he redeemed. And it's third person sing, masculine singular redeemed, preceded by the by the Greek hina that can which makes it a, a, like a participle phrase, um, and where and the hina is tra translated as as so that so that he might redeem that that's that 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 sense and and what's what's he just completely doesn't get is that yes God is the subject of the sentence. But because of it, because of the hina followed by the third person, this is a subordinate clause, and in a subordinate clause, there's going to be a subject relative to the clause, and in this particular case, the natural reading would be to the nearest preceding applicable person, and that's his son. Not God. God is much earlier in the sentence. It's his son is the nearest preceding, um, the nearest preceding applicable person. So that's what it's going. To, it's going to be referred to his son, not to God, in the natural reading, unless there's some overriding concern. Now, just to, to um, so you can get the idea of what's going on, I'm going to point to another verse, which will make this very, very clear. And, and I want you to, con to see that the, this structure exactly the sa is exactly the same. Um, the verb in this case is also third per the third person masculine singular, but it's deceive. And it also proceeds with the hina, so it's so that he, he might not deceive. Uh, it's, and and you'll, you'll see that the, the structure is very similar. Um, but let, let's, let's apply Doherty's reasoning to another passage and watch what happens. Let us now take a look at Revelation 23, where it begins, and he threw him into the abyss. Now, first of all, if you look, it, it starts out with, then I saw an angel 
coming down from heaven. So there's this angel of God who laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound them for a thousand years. And verse 3 begins, And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he... So this has, the, it has the same, as I said, it has the same exact structure, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Well, who's the he here? Who is that he referring to? Well, according to Earl Doherty's reasoning, since these do have, this does have the same structure, it's the, it, it's the Greek Hina followed by, and, and then you have the third person masculine singular, it verbal form, which, so you have the pro, a, an implied pronoun in, when you translate it into English. According to Earl Doherty, the he must refer to the subject of the sentence. But the he, the subject, the subject of the sentence is the angel. So it's it. So according to Earl Doherty, it's so that the angel of God would not deceive the nations any longer. Well, obviously that's not the case. The the one who is deceiving the nation is the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil of Satan. And the reason is because this is a subordinate clause. It ha the hina makes a subordinate clause. It has a subject relative to the clause, and it's the nearest preceding applicable person, which in this case would be the devil and Satan. Um, same here with the him here. It's the same idea. It's This is a subordinate clause. It has a subject relative to the clause. Just because the subject, there's a subject in the sentence doesn't mean the ver every verb in the sentence applies to that subject because you could be saying A does B while B does C. Well, the second verb applies to B, not to A. So, it, you, you, this, so what he's saying here is just absolutely amateurish. It's nonsense, completely ridiculous. And I think that this pretty much proves the point. In his attempt to defend the indefensible, that is, make born of a woman not mean, well, born of a woman, um, Delberty cites... Ernest DeWitt Burton's commentary on Galatians, an attempt to sever the, the phrases born of a woman, born under the law, from the from the phrase God sent his son. But and and then say this this is all spiritual talk, etc., as as we'll get to in a moment. But it's com he completely quote minds Clinton. It, it just absolutely once you read Clinton, it, Clinton's actual words, it, it becomes pretty clear, because Clinton explicitly says, born of a woman cannot exclude that natural birth meaning, that that's what it means, and, and anyone who says differently is wrong, and so Delroy is citing someone who just simply says he's wrong. Um, it, it's astonishing, but then Delroy tries to turn this as, as as Doherty puts it, and here I'm quoting his words, finally, the two qualifying phrases, born of a woman, born under the law, are descriptive of the son, but not necessarily tied to the present sending. The International Critical Commentary by Burton on Galatians, page 216, footnote, points out that the way the verb and participle tenses are used in the Greek, the birth and subjection to the law are presented as simple facts with no necessary tempor temporal relation to the main verb sense. In other words, the conditions of being born of a woman and being made subject to the law, Burton's preferred meaning, do not have to be seen as things that occurred at the present. Paul has simply enumerated two of the characteristics of the spiritual Christ, which are relevant to the issues under discussion. Well, what are we going to make of that? Huh? Well, let's actually go to Burton himself and see what he makes of that. Okay, so here we are on page 216 of Clinton's work, which is where they begin the the verse under discussion, the passage under discussion, and here it is, as a matter of fact, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made subject to the law, and we go down here a little further to the particular part we want, where he's talking about the sending of Christ, he says, though it, that, that, that these words, though in, though in themselves capable of referring to the sending of Jesus as God's son, now what I, the point I want to make here first is that Burton's objective at this point was comparing the sending of Jesus to events such as the sending of the prophets, that is, the sending from a private life to public ministry. 
Burton will make the point, as we'll see, that God's sending of Jesus can be interpreted as an ongoing action beginning at Jesus' birth and lasting throughout his earthly ministry of his life, rather than just referring to a singular event at Jesus' birth. So what he's, he's talking about this sending of Jesus as, of, as God's son out from among men, from, this ex, from the seclusion of his private life, must yet, in view of the apostles' belief in the pre-existence of Jesus and of the parallelism in verse 6 when he talks about the sending of the Holy Spirit, be interpreted as having reference to the sending of the Son from his pre-existing state into the world. This is also confirmed by the two expressions that follow, both of which are evidently added to indicate the humiliation to which the Son was in the in the sending forth subjected, the descent to the level of those who, whom he came to redeem. For if, if the sending referred simply to a sending forth among men, as a prophet is sent forth among divine commissions, these expressions would mark its condition previous to that sending forth, and there would be no suggestion of humiliation, but rather the contrary. Um, he, and what he states here is that that's word, that sending need not and probably should not be limited to the entrance into the world and by and at birth, but rather should be understood as extending to and including the appearance of Jesus among men as one sent from God. So basically the point is the sending isn't limited to the original birth, but includes his whole earth, his whole, whole earthly life, that all of it is being sent. He's sent by God throughout the entire throughout his entire life, rather than just at that point. Um, now, after this, I want you to notice that when he gets to the the phrase, the, when he a little later, when he gets to the phrase "born of a woman," that he that he says something that Doherty absolutely misses completely, um, and it's right here. The phrase "genomenon ekeneikos," which is born of a woman, that's the phrase translated as, commonly translated as born of woman, can not, and here, here is that phrase right there, can not be interpreted as excluding human paternity as some interpreters both ancient and modern have maintained. Thus, here we have the spectacle of having the very source Doherty cited to make his point that born of a woman did not refer to a human birth, stating emphatically that it did refer to a human birth. Um, so that that's complete nonsense immediately. Um, now, when we go to the footnote, that so what is where does Doherty really getting his stuff from a footnote? So when we'll, we'll go down further, and it, and the footnote begins here, um, and where when he refers to the aorist participle. Uh, the em employment of the aorist presents a birth and subjection, so that that all that comes down a little further, I believe, right here. All right. Um, in the footnote, Doherty cited, Doherty simply leaves out some important factors out of his conclusion, such as what I've just shown you in the main part of the text. The fact is, Burton never states the two clauses would not apply at the time of the sending, as Doherty infers or could even be conceived as such. What he states is that the force of the grammar makes each clause a simple fact, and this makes both attributive participles. That is, they are about the nature of Jesus and not descending. However, he states that the connection between them is to be inferred from the logic of the facts rather than the grammar, and points out that they act very much as adverbial participles of attendant circumstances. That is, circumstances that are coordinate to the finite verb, but are stated independently of it. And we'll see here what he says. The employment of the aorist presents the birth and the subjection to law as in each case a simple fact and leaves the temporal relation to be inferred solely from the nature of the facts referred to. The thought is not very different if the participles are be taken as adverbial participles of attendant circumstances. Both the phrases but the phrases are best accounted for as independent intended uh, at not so much 
to express the accompaniments of the sending as directly to characterize the sun, describing the relation to humanity and the soul in, in the law in which he performs his mission. Doherty here has quite clearly quote mine Burton and left out the equation, both the context of his remarks and the fact that he clearly stated that any attempt to interpret the passage born of a woman to exclude human paternity is clearly wrong. In fact, it gets worse when Doherty later Doherty then goes on to state that Burton also notes that the word translated as born, genomenon, is not the most unambiguous verb to use for this concept uh, to give birth. With a, there's a more straightforward one, genau, but instead Paul uses a form of genome, which has a broader meaning of to become, to come into existence. Out of woman, of course, implies the birth, but the point is the broader concept lends itself better to the atmosphere of myth, if that is what Paul had in mind. Well, here, again, Doherty completely misrepresents Burton. As I've already demonstrated, Burton rejected any interpretation that excluded human paternity for born of a woman. The point he made was actually as not concerning the first clause at all. It concerned the second of the clauses. It was the second of the clauses that he was talking about, not the first. You see, the, the word being used does have a wider meaning, but he, he stated quite clearly that the born of a woman, that that, that phrase, which is a fir actually fairly common in Koine Greek to use that word for born, but it wasn't, ex it wasn't restricted to that. It had a more broader, a broader meaning as well as, as in coming. Um, but he states that unlike in the first, this, the, in the second, it need not be born. And that, that was Burton's point. He says in the first one, it definitely means a natural birth. In the second one, it uses the broader meaning. So Doherty has completely misrepresented what he says, and, and you'll see, and that comes um, a little, I believe that, that comes, oh, that's also in, in here, um, do, 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 do. Uh, that all, that, here it is, in fact, the word, and here, this, these are the words that refer to the second, notice he's talking about the second phrase, not the first phrase, okay, it's the second phrase, the born under the law, as it's often as it's often translated, but he's making the case it should be translated as made subject to the law. He said this should be probably be taken in the sense made subject to the law rather than born under the law. For although, and notice here's the first phrase, he says, while this evidently refers to birth, that reference is neither conveyed by nor imparted to the participle, but lies wholly in the limiting phrase. Thus, he's saying this word, the the word here doesn't always necessarily mean born, but this limiting phrase makes it, this limiting phrase is what determines that. And in the first, in the first, um, the first clause, which is this one, although this can have a broader meaning, this limiting phrase here definitely imparts the meaning of birth. So this is completely contradicting what Doherty said. He says, the idea, therefore, is not of necessity carried over to the second phrase. So he's, the thing that he's saying it doesn't necessarily mean born is, is in the second phrase, not the first. And Doherty has completely misrepresented what Burton said. It's, it's in, in fact, it's just complete, it's so amateurish that you wonder um, how he could, he, he could even miss it. I mean, Burton clearly states that it's in the second of the two clauses that the ambiguity arises and not in the first. As already mentioned, he had explicitly stated the first clause cannot exclude, exclude human paternity. Here, even in the footnote Doherty is citing, he very clearly states that the limiting phrase of a woman definitely limits that first clause to born, but not the second clause. And he always arguing is not that the first one doesn't mean born, but that in the second one, it need not be restricted to born. And, and here he says, we should apply the more general meaning. Um, thus Doherty's egregious blunder here is that he cited Burton as a, as a witness to the ambiguity of genomenon in the first clause, when Burton only stated the ambiguity existed in the second clause. Moreover, Burton had already made very clear the first clause cannot be interpreted as anything but the literal birth of a child. Uh, such distortion in the use of a source is simply inexcusable and quite clearly illustrates how Doherty and 
other mythicists who have followed him in this in this regard are not really concerned at all with determining what the what texts actually state, but only in clumsily creating a mythical Jesus, even if it takes blatant dishonesty to do so. And here we see a perfect example of that. At this point, in attempting to sidestep the mourn of a woman issue, Doherty more recently offered the uh, a, another explanation. Um, the, he, he offers this, that that uh, God sent, he say as he says, God sent his son, and he points out the verb ex apostello, um, that is what actually appears there, God sent. This verb of sending is used in the Old Testament in connection with the sending of spiritual beings, such as angels or personified wisdom in the wisdom of Solomon um, in 9.10. Well, first of all, ex apostello, is Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, um, or apostello or ex apostello. They're, they're Greek. The Old Testament's written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and little little bits of it in Aramaic, but not Greek. Uh, if in, in the wisdom of Solomon, he refers to is not really part of the canonical Jewish scriptures, and that's actually part of the apocryphal books. But I I'm, don't even want to get into that argument at this point, um, because Doherty's claim. If we just take sending in general in, in the Hebrew, his claim that the verb of sending by God is used in connection with sending spiritual beings is just simply wrong. Yes, there are there, all different points in the Old Testament where God sends angels, for example, to you know to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever. But these are far outnumbered by the occurrences where God sends men like Moses or sends the prophets uh, to individuals or groups of people. They, they, those far outnumber the occurrences where he sends spiritual beings. So Doherty is just simply wrong. It, that's nonsense. It's just, it's just not true. And I doubt he's really done any checking into that at all. Um, Doherty then continues by using the tenses to connect the two sendings that, he, that have already been um, proved invalid earlier. As, as, as in this video, but he states that the basic form of the verb apostello is regularly used to denote the sending of the Holy Spirit. And he says the verb and its variants can also be used to speak of sending a person. Notice that he just kind of drops that in. Um, the identical form of the verb in verse 4, God sent his son, is also used in verse 6 to say that God sent into our hearts the spirit of the son. Again, we've already proven that those two are not the same thing. Both are, he says, these are, this is an aorist tense placing both these actions in the past. Then he says, some translations of the verb in, render it in the perfect tense, God has sent into our hearts, but this can be misleading. And he, and he goes on and on, but the, he, he's trying to say that the two sendings are essentially contemporary. Well, no, they're not, as I've already proven earlier, both by the grammar and by the logic of the passage, they can't be earlier. They're, it's a sequence, and they're separate points in the sequence. But Doherty not really having that good a grasp of Greek grammar, and certainly not having any grasp of logical deduction, can't seem to understand any of that. Um, now, one thing that that if you read what Doherty's excuse in this regard, that should be evident, is as I said, his inability to use logic properly. The two sendings could not possibly be the same, as I've already demonstrated. They are the second and fifth items in a linear sequence, with each a prerequisite for the next. Um, as for apostello and its variants being used, regularly used for the sending of the Holy Spirit, um, Doherty fails to mention that this is not surprising, since it's the Greek word for send, no matter who's being sent. There is nothing about the word that insists upon a spiritual connotation. Um, it's, and, and as I point out, the word is actually ex apostello or related, but not identical word to apostello. That means to send forth um, or send away. And its occurrences in the New Testament, by the way, ex apostello, is used of men in all but one occurrence which is Galatians 4, 6. As for apostello itself, it is commonly used in the New Testament of both men and spiritual beings. So there's no inference here that it must be. In fact, in elsewhere, um, in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, for example, Paul uses that verb of himself being sent. So 
obviously this doesn't have, there's no no inference here to spiritual beings um there's no necessarily inference there and it, that Doherty's trying to make one that it's more commonly used of the holy spirit is blatantly misleading to his readers who are not likely in a position to be able to check this out for themselves um the sloppy exegesis that we've seen in his explanation of this passage is quite common through much of Doherty's work. It's perhaps a byproduct of him trying, trying to make excuses for, the, for why his position does seem so out of place in the text. Uh, and as he ties himself into logical knots, seeking to avoid the clear meaning of the passages in context, such as this one, uh, Paul believed Jesus was born of a Jewish woman. That's a simple fact. That Jesus was born of a woman and subject to the law has an obvious meaning to everyone except ideologues like Doherty who inhabit the world of Jesus mythicism. Now, perhaps sensing his explanations were non-starters, Doherty has also presented back a backup plan in which he argues the phrase phrases born of a woman born under the law were later interpolations. This is common, very, very common among mythicists whenever they come across something they don't like. They just say, oh, well, that was added later. They don't, that, no evidence for this, of course. Um, they, they never do have any evidence for it. They make lame arguments which presuppose their own their own position. Uh, so it's all running around in, in, in tight circles. Um, but there's no evidence for this. Uh, it, in fact, in, the, the, in this particular case, we have, there are one of the earliest manuscripts, uh, P46, which dates from about 175 AD to maybe 225, no, it's, it's somewhere in that range, um, has this verse in it, and it's there. The, the, every manuscript we have that contains this particular area of the text contains born of a woman, born under the law. There's not no exceptions. There's no textual variance on that. Thus, Doherty is asking us to believe that such an addition was made without any example of an original reading surviving at a time when there was no controls or on the transmission of the text there was no no one controlling it no no um no one you know constantine there to you know burn the ones we don't like or anything like that no they can't make that those conspiracy theory arguments here because this is centuries before constantine and we found the manuscripts that were buried, you know, we've basically found buried manuscripts and things that, that no one's had since then. But we don't find that any of the, in, it, we don't find it missing in any of the earlier texts. We don't find them there. Thus, he's asking us, but he's asking us to believe that such an addition was made with no, nothing ever surviving. And even, I mean, but think about this, even much more obvious things that, that, people would pick up immediately like the uh like the ad the a, a manuscripts without the ending of the gospel of mark which, which if those familiar with the gospel 16 those survived those survived in fact they 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 were actually in manuscripts that were probably commissioned by constantine but those are there but you're telling me this little one that's really in a kind of an obscure one that no one would have even thought of at all if he had, if it had been omitted, no one would have even noticed um, if if there had if one of the omission ones omitted ones had survived if they had ever existed, that didn't survive. But you you can get you can slip the eliminating almost all Mark sixteen and, and no one and that 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 survives. But this one wouldn't. No no no. It's it's it's. You're not going to get, with the uncontrolled manner in which the New Testament was transmitted, you're not going to get such scrubbings of the historical record in these early te early manuscripts. It doesn't, it's not going to occur. Um, and in fact, the only reason Doherty suggests an interpolation here is simply that the, that the phrases, the, the clauses here, destroy his theory. They just demolish it. And it seems far, actually, be honest, when you look at the evidence as a whole, it's far, far more reasonable to discard Doherty's crank theories than to discard the clauses. Um, and after all said and done, there's no getting around this. Um, now, one of Doherty's arguments, for example, is, well, well, you know, they, and, and, and in, in terms of being an interpolation is that, well, 
how how unusual i mean how how common is it to be cold to have to have someone add born of a woman that this is very unnatural to add this phrase born of a woman well read the context the entire as i pointed out earlier the entire passage is about god's prompt the whole chapters and chapters these initial chapters here on in galatians they're going to i think it starts at chapter two going through chapter four it's all talking about god's promise to abraham how god would send a seed of abraham that who would that would basically be the promised one the seed of a the seed of abraham and 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 paul's making the case that, that it's jesus who's the son of god well in order to do this in order to be a seed of abraham he's he's this, he's in his writings paul's assuming jesus pre-existed his birth as burton has pointed out that it, there was a pre-existent jesus um these but then he goes on to say that he took basically took on human flesh and what he's stating here is god sent his son born of a woman born made subject to the law or born under the law however you want to translate it but that's important because those two statements make jesus subject to the law and make and thus born born of a woman born on, and born or made subject to the law that makes him a seed of abraham he's a seed of abraham and that's the whole point paul's trying to prove is that the seed of abraham came in the person of jesus christ without that he could he could be he could have been born anywhere but he places him in this place as a seed of abraham to fulfill that specific promise which is the entire context of the of the of the the phrase of this whole clause the con entire context of this whole passage is in f that jesus is the fulfillment of that earlier promise he and he went through the whole history of it over chapters in galatians talking about the promise to abraham but nobody ignores all of that as i said he just rips things out and say, see look that looks weird putting that born of a woman here you would never say that you were born of a woman well you wouldn't say you were the son of god either and you wouldn't say that you were the fulfillment of a promise made to abraham centuries earlier that one of his seed would be the fulfillment then would bless all the nations etc cetera, etc cetera. those things but if those things are necessary to fulfill that promise yes they're they do belong there but nobody doesn't understand any of this and his frankly his followers don't understand any of it because they're not really concerned with the truth they're concerned with ideology and and well some of them may like to think they're concerned with the truth but they've never actually sat down and read and they're just dwelling basically they're 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 being fed a line and their own ignorance is keeping them in darkness and that's pretty much it and on that note, in all things, may to God be all the glory. And until next time, God bless.